Today's video will demonstrate how to store floating point numbers in memory. Hello, I'm James Helfrich. Storing integers in memory is rather straightforward because every bit corresponds to a power of two. Floating point numbers are far more complex because we have to store both the precision and the exponent. This video will explain how we store floating point numbers in memory. To understand how this works, let's start with a real number. Let's say 3,081.625, and we kind of just write it like that. Uh, now, we can represent this as a string by saying, quote, 3,081.625, and here we're going to have eight characters in our string, seven digits, and a decimal point. Now, we can also represent it as an array of characters, 3081.625, which is really just what a string is. There's really no difference there. And the final thing we can do is we can look at this as an array of digits. Now, the problem is that decimal point. That decimal point is not a digit. So what I have to do is I have to represent 3081 and then I have to say, oh, take that decimal out, which means I have to remember where the decimal point is. Now, observe that 3 is in the 10 to the third place, 0 is in the 10 squared place, 8 is in the 10 to the 1 place, and 1 is the 10 to the 0 place. Remember, 10 to the 0 is 1. 6 is 1 tenth, 2 is in the 100th, and 5 is the 1,000th place. Okay, so let's start with fixed point notation. A fixed point notation is when the decimal point is always in a known position. For an example, my GPA always has one decimal point of accuracy, 3.9. And money, you know, unless you work for a gas station, always has two decimal places. So now when we know where the decimal point is, then a fixed point notation is very possible. Okay, And this works both with decimal numbers, like 383081, and then we know where that decimal point is, 625. And with, like we had before, we can compute the powers of each spot in the array. There's a 10 to the third spot, 10 squared spot, 10 one spot. And then so that's 3,000 plus 0 plus 80 plus 1 plus, well, 6 times 10 to the negative 1 is 0.6 plus 0.02 plus 0 0.005. And that gives us, of course, 3,081.625. Now, I could do exactly the same number with fixed point notation with binary, okay? Except now each spot is not going to be a power of 10, but rather a power of 2. So the most significant digit is 2 to the 11, and then 2 to the 10, and 2 to the 9, and so on. And then if I take that value, uh, 2 to the 11 is 2048, and since there's a 1 there, I add that on. And 2 to the 10 is 1024, since there's a 1 there, I add it on. 2 to the 9 is 512, but you know what? There's a 0, so I add a 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. The next one I have is a 2 to the 3 spot, which is 8. The next one I have is 2 to the 0 spot, which is a 1. So 2048 plus 1024 plus 8 plus 1 is 3081. And then this also works with to the right of the decimal point with the fractions. 2 to the negative 1 is 0 0.5. 2 to the negative 2 is 0.5. 2, 5, which I have a zero there, so I don't add it. And 2 to negative 3 is 0.125. And I add all that up, and I get the same 3,081.625. Okay, so floating point numbers are going to be different. Floating point number is when both the, the number and the exponent is provided. And the, the poster child for this is, you know, scientific notation. For an example, the gravitational constant is 6.67430 times 10 to the negative 11. And notice how we use floating point numbers often in science to represent very large or very small numbers. It's called floating point because the decimal point floats according to the spot of the exponent, okay? Now, of course, in C++, we represent the same number as 6.67430 e negative 1, 1, and I don't have to say times 10 to the negative 11. I actually learned about this floating point notation for computers when I was in high school. And then I started writing this in my phys physics class. My physics teacher was like, what is this notation? And then I showed it to him and then he started using it. So it's actually way more convenient. Now, the important thing to notice here is with floating point numbers, we have two parts to the number. We have the significant and the exponent. The significant is the number, okay? And it's going to be the 6.667430 part of the equation. And the exponent is what we're raising it to. Since this is base 10, it's me 10 to the negative 11, okay? And that's the exponent part. 
Now, uh, the IEEE standard 754 describes how floating point numbers work. And they divide it up into actually three fields. We have the sign field, which is the most significant bit. Then we have the exponent fields, which in this case is going to be five bits. And then the significant field, which is the rest. Okay. Now, the real number we get out of this is negative one times the sign, which is either there or not, zero or one, plus one point significant, and we'll learn about this in a minute, it's called the trailing significant bit, and then times two to the exponent, and this is the format that our number is in. Now there's actually three different standard floating point numbers. There is the half width, which is a 16-bit number, one for the sign, five for the exponent, and, and 10 for the significant. Notice one and five and 10 is going to be 16. There's a float, which is a standard 32-bit number, 1, 8, and 23, and the double, which is a 64-bit number, 1, 11, and 52. Okay. Now, the significant is stored in something called the trailing significant field. And this is all part of the IEEE 754 standard, okay? And it's, it's a kind of a weird format, uh, but let me explain to you why this is. Okay, first of all, it's not going to be the standard two's complement because the sign is stored elsewhere. We really want the negative or positive to be in the most significant bit. Um, second, this is a fixed point number. In other words, the decimal point is always one spot to the right of the most significant bit. And the most significant bit is always going to be a one. Therefore, we don't really need the one now, do we? Okay, so that means 1.10011101 actually becomes the uh, 10011101. We just know there's a bit before the most significant bit, and we know the decimal point is right there. That's the trailing significant field. Okay, so let's see how we compute this. Let's take 51.3125, and we want to compute the trailing significant field. Now, first of all, I'm just going to turn it into powers of two, and this is going to be the two to the five, which is 32. There's one of those. 2 to the 4, which is 16, there's one of those, and that's 48. Uh, there's no 2 to the 3, there's no 2 to the 2, but there's a 2 to the 1, which is going to be a 2, and a 2 to the 0, which is going to be a 1. And then we also have no 0.5s, we have a 0.25, we don't have a, a 1.25, and so on. And so we add that whole thing up, that's 32 from the 2 to the 5, 16, 2 to the 4, 2, 2 to the 1, and 1, 2 to the 0 plus 0.25 plus 0.0625. And I'm going to take the whole thing and I'm going to multiply by the exponent, which is zero. And so that's two to the zero. And that gives us 51.3125 times two to the zero, which is one. And that's going to give us 51.3125. So that's how we store this with a fixed point notation. Now, notice, I can take that decimal point and I can take it all the way to the right, okay? But when I move it to the right, I got to make a subsequent change to the exponent, right? Now, in this case, when I move it to the right, notice how my powers of two change. I had to add four to each power of two as I move that decimal place is four to the right, which kind of makes sense if you think about it. So now that, that most significant bit is not two to the five or 32, but now it's two to the nine, which is 512. Okay, so now I have 512 plus 256 plus 32 plus 16 plus 4 plus 1, and that's all the bits that I have there, times 2 to the negative 4. And what does that equal? 821 times 2 to the negative 4. But what's 2 to the negative 4? That's um, negative 2 to the 4 is 16, so it's divided by 16, which gives me the same number, 51.3125. So we have two different ways to represent the same number. Now, the trailing significant field does not put the decimal point in the middle, like in the top, it does not put it on the right, like my next one. Instead, it goes all the way to the left, except for we have a one to the left of it, right? And so now, what's my exponent going to be? Well, what's one left of the exponent? Well, it's going to be two to the zero, and then two to the negative one, negative two, negative three, negative four, and so on. And so this is going to be two to the zero is going to be one, two to the uh, negative one is going to be 0.5, two to the negative four would be 0 0.0625 and so on. And all this is times two to the five. In other words, when I move that decimal point to the left, 
then I add exponents. When I move it to the right, I subtract exponents. And so that all turns into 1.6031351, so on, which looks kind of random, but I multiply that two to the five, and two to the five is gonna be 32, and that actually gives me 51.3125. And that is my trailing significant field, 10011101. Okay, so let's see if you can uh, find the trailing significant field and the association exponent for the following numbers. First of all, we'll take 91.75. I will immediately put this in a fixed point notation and notice how the decimal point is, um, is almost all the way to the right. So it's 0, 0, 001 and that one corresponds to 64. Zero, which would be 32. One, which is 16. One, which is eight zero, which is four, one, which is two, and one, which is one. And that gives me 91 if you add it all up. Point one is 0 0.5, one, 0.25. And that's for the exponent zero. Now, what I'm gonna do is I gotta shift that decimal point to the left. And every time I move it to the ones to the left, I add one to my exponent. One to the left, one to my exponent, one to my left, one to my exponent, and so on, until I, I have only a single one to the left of it. And that is my trailing significant field. All right, now we really wanna make sure we got this right here. So I'm going to uh, multiply this whole thing out. I have a one point to the left of this field here. So I have a, always have a one there plus not 0.5 because that's a zero. 0.25, that's my one. 0.125, that's my next one. The zero would be after that and so on. I add the whole thing up, multiply it by two to the six. That's gonna be 1.4335375 times 64, because two to the six is 64. Multiply that together and I get the same number, 91.75. Cool, that worked perfectly. Let's do another one here. I'm gonna have 0 0.080075. Okay, now notice how my decimal point is far to the left here, okay? So at my... My, I'm going to start with 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, exponent 0. But now, uh, instead of moving my decimal point to the left, I got to move it to the right. And when I move it to the right, I subtract 1, subtract 1, subtract 1, subtract 1. Now I have one point, so the decimal point is in the correct location. Okay, so that means my trailing significant field is 1, I throw that away, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, and then the rest are zeros. Okay, I really wanna make sure this is right here. So when I multiply it out, um, remember I have that one to the left of my leftmost digit, plus not 0.5, but 0.25 plus, and I have skip a whole bunch, zero, three, one, two, five. And this is times two to the negative four. Okay, so this is 1.28125 times uh, two to the four is 16. Therefore, two to the negative four is one over 16. Multiply it out and whoa, I got a different number right? Not all floating point numbers can be represented precisely uh, with a fixed number of bits. Now, I can approximate it better with I have more significant, but in this case, I got to be happy with what I have. That's the closest I can do with such a small floating point number. Okay, try this yourself. Here are five problems. Each one is increasing level of difficulty, uh, 1.5, 4.25, 32, 0 0.0625, and then 42.6565. See if you can find the trailing significant field and the associated exponent with each. Okay, now that we know the trailing significant field, the next part is the exponent bias. This is how we store the exponent. Now, um, keep in mind, our exponent can be negative, right? Um, so we have to have some sort of signed notation. It turns out that the IEEE standard does not use two's complement um, as it uses for integers. Instead, we're gonna do something different. And the reason for this is just a little bit weird. I want to be able to compare two floating point numbers and see which one is bigger without having to worry about which part of the field is the exponent and which is not. Therefore, the most significant bit has to be in sort order, which means zero is not gonna be all zeros. We're gonna see what that mean, how that works in just a minute here. Now, in order to compute the exponent bias, I first have to compute something called the bias. And the bias is two to the exp, which is the width of my exponent field, minus one, and that whole thing, minus one. All right, so my half bias for a 16-bit number is gonna be a five-bit exponent field. So my exp is gonna be five. So two to the five minus one is gonna be two to the four. Two to the four is 16. 16 minus one is gonna be 15 base 10 or zero, 1111 one, 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 base 2. 
Now, my float bias for a 32-bit number, which should have an 8-bit exponent field, it's 2 to the 8, because remember, exp is 8, when my exponent field is aside 8. 8 minus 1, 2 to the 7, which is, which is 128, minus 1, 127, base 10, which is 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, base 2. Now, finally, for my double bias for a 64-bit number, I have an 11-bit exponent field, which is 2 to the 11 minus 1, which is 2 to the 10. 2 to the 10 is 1,024. Minus 1 is 1,023. Base 10, which is 0, and then 9 ones. Now, one thing you'll notice for each one of these is my exponent bias is always all ones except for the most significant bit, which is 0. And that's an important property of the exponent bias, okay? Now, I take my exponent bias, which is what I drop into the exponent field, equals my bias, which is this number I just computed, plus the exponent. So if my exponent is 0, then my exponent bias will be 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1. Okay? Now, notice that if my exponent field is negative, it's always going to be zeros. And if it's positive, if I even have a one there, then it pushes that leading bit to one, which means po positive numbers are bigger than negative numbers, um, even if you don't know about the signs, because the most significant bit for positive numbers are one, and for the most significant bit for negative numbers are zero. And that's an important property of the exponent bias, and that's why I triply chose to use it. Okay, so... Um, we're going to do a little bit of math here with 6-bit and 12-bit exponent fields. We could do arbitrary size. We're going to choose 6 and 12 just for fun. Okay, so first, and remember, my bias is 2 to the exp minus 1. And then my exponent bias is the bias plus the exponent. So first, we'll do 6-bit. Now, my bias is going to be 2 to the exp minus 1. The exp, the size my exponent with, is going to be 6. 6 minus 1 is 5. 2 to the 5 is going to be 32. 32 minus 1 is 31, and that's a bias. So let's try to compute 7 base 10, what's, and that's my exponent field, and I want to compute the exponent bias. So the formula is bias plus exponent. My bias is 31 base 10. My exponent is 7 base 10. 31 plus 7 is 38 base 10. And now I want to convert this into a 6-bit integer unsigned, and that'll be 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0. Notice how it's positive, and positive numbers and exponent bias have a 1 in the most significant bit. Now, just for kicks, let's do negative 7, okay? So we're going to have the same bias plus exponent formula. My bias is 31. My exponent is going to be negative 7, okay? So I add those together, I'm going to get 24, okay? Now, 24, when I multiply it out, is 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, right? And the reason for that is because it's 16 plus 8, plus 0, plus 0, plus 0, and that's going to be 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, and that's going to be uh, my exponent bias. Now, negative numbers have a 0 in the most significant bit, so therefore it will sort below um, the positive numbers, which is the desirable property. And then we'll do 0, and so that's 37 minus, 31 minus 0 is going to be 31, which means 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, just like we did before. Okay, we're going to do exactly the same exercise with 12-bit exponent field, okay? So my bias is going to be exp minus 1. Now, exp is 12 now. 12 minus 1 is 11. 11, 2 to the 11 is 2048. Minus 1 is 2047, and that's my exponent. That's my bias. So now, when I want to find 7 is my exponent, that's going to be to uh, 2047, which is my bias, plus 7, my exponent, and that's going to be 2054, which is going to be 1 and a whole bunch of zeros and 1, 1, 0. Okay, positive number, the leading bit is going to be 1. Now, just take a minute here and compare my 6-bit and my 12-bit numbers. Notice how they both have the same uh, most significant bit and the least significant bits are the same. The difference is the filler of zeros. There's a lot more zeros with the 12 bit and those all happen after the leading bit. And that's an important property of the exponent bias field. Now we're gonna do negative seven. So that's 2047 minus seven, which is 2040, and which is gonna be zero and then a whole bunch of ones and zero, zero, zero. Now, once again, compare this with my six bit version. And we're going to see my most significant bits the same, zero. My least significant bits are the same, zero, zero, zero. But the filler is different. And we're going to have all these ones in the middle. In other words, with a positive number, we fill with zeros. With a negative number, we fill with ones. And then finally, my zero, as you can imagine, this is going to look exactly like my exponent bias. 
All right, let's see if you can do this. Compute the bias for a 5-bit, an 8-bit, and an 11-bit number. And then once you have the bias com computed, now compute the exponent bias of 1, of negative 1, of 31 and negative 11. And do this for, like we said before, the 5, the 8, and the 11-bit uh, wide fields. If you would like to learn more about how floating point numbers are implemented in memory, how to do math of floating point numbers, or anything else, take a look at the floating point chapter of the C++ Data Structures textbook.